Unfortunately for uh, us as Americans, racism has played a very important and big role in our country's development. Uh, it has marked our country probably more so than almost any other country in the world, and unfortunately, that is also true of the church in America. Uh, the church has been greatly affected by racism throughout the years. In fact, uh, y'all know I love to, to read stories from the past, and I heard of a story recently of a Baptist church from the past, and basically what happened is this church had been part of a community for a long time, and the community around them started to change, and the church was declining, and so they wanted to start reaching all the new people in the community, and so they started trying to do that, and eventually the very first person of color that they had ever had in that church came to visit one Sunday. And the church did not receive him well at all. Uh, no one welcomed him. Everyone was suspicious of him. And no one ever really made him feel like he was family or like he belonged there. But by God's grace, this man continued to come week after week until finally the Lord convicted him of his sins and saved him. And not only did he become the very first person of color to be saved in that church, the very next Sunday, the pastor baptized him right there in that church, and he became the very first person of color who was saved and baptized in that church, in their entire history. And immediately after the service, someone came up to the pastor, a church member, and said, so who's going to bleach the baptismal now? Everybody uncomfortable yet? Yeah? Okay, good. We're going to stay there pretty much the whole time. So, I told you that was a, a Baptist church from the past. So you might be hoping, I hope that it's somewhere in the deep, deep south, right? Like not South Carolina. We're hoping it's somewhere a little further south than us. Maybe you're thinking this is a story from the 1800s or early 1900s. But in fact, the church was in Greenville, South Carolina. And the year was 2018. That just happened right down the road from us six years ago that a man said that in a church gathering. Now, we hear that story and it makes us all very uncomfortable, right? And, and you hear that story, it makes you uncomfortable, but the, the thing is, that's exactly how everyone would have felt when Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. It made everybody uncomfortable. It made everybody uneasy. In fact, this whole sermon might make you uncomfortable. So welcome to our visitors. You picked a great Sunday to come. But it makes us uncomfortable because this parable has a way of getting at our hearts. It has a way of exposing the prejudices that we have in our hearts. Because you see, something that's true for a lot of religious people today is that people of the world live in the shadow of our noses. Religious people love to hold their head high and look their nose down on everybody who is not like them. We love to judge people based on one aspect of who they are as a person. And, and the reason for that is very simple. It's because our world has actually conditioned us to do this. Our world has conditioned us to home in on one aspect of a person and make it that person's entire identity. You see it within the LGBT community. Their whole identity is their sexuality. It's not just a part of them. It's not just a part of their life. It is their whole identity. It is who they are. You see it with people's vocation, right? For many people, their job is their identity. That is who they are. It's not just something they go to every day. It is what makes them who they are as a person. You see it with material goods. For, for many people today, their whole identity is wrapped up in the kind of house they live in, and the kind of car they drive, and the name brand clothing that they wear, or making sure they always have the latest smartphone that's going to come out. That's, I promise you, it's exactly like the last one, okay? But you don't need that new one. It's just like the last one. But for many people, they have to have these things because their identity is wrapped up in material goods. For other people, it's their race. Their race isn't just a part of them. It becomes their whole identity. Do you see how we do this, right? Our world has conditioned us. Focus on something that makes up a person and make it their whole identity. And then religious people also focus on that and then they judge people for it. They judge people for where they are 
right now. But let me tell you something this morning. Here's the good news of the gospel. The gospel tells us you are not your sexuality. You are not your job. You are not your material goods. You are not the clothes you wear or the car you drive. The gospel reminds us that what you are is an image bearer of God made in the likeness of God himself. That is who you are. Whatever else may contribute to a person's identity, whatever else may contribute to who a person is, you are first and foremost an image bearer of God himself made in his likeness. And that is where we must start. That has to be our starting point. And if we actually did this, if we actually took the time to remember that every human being on earth is someone made in the image of God, you would see a whole lot less racism in our world today. You'd see a whole lot less prejudice in our world today. And judgmentalism and injustice. And that's what Jesus is getting at in this parable. He's telling this lawyer and everyone who can hear him, you're focusing on the outside. You're looking at all this outside stuff that, that makes up who a person is and contributes to them, but you're missing the person himself. You see, Jesus is saying this parable in response to a lawyer's question. And actually, the lawyer's going to ask two questions in the parable. And both times, he's going to ask the wrong question. He misses the mark both times entirely. And maybe this morning you're here and, and you're asking the wrong questions too. Maybe like the lawyer, you're asking wrong questions about salvation. Maybe like the lawyer, you're asking wrong questions about who you are called to love and show mercy to. And, and my prayer is that as we go through this parable together, Jesus is going to begin to expose all those wrong questions you're asking and shine gospel light on some of those dark spots on all of our hearts. That's my prayer as we go through this. So let's, let's look at verse 25 together. Luke 10, beginning in verse 25, notice what the Bible says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So, so who's Jesus talking to here? He's talking to a lawyer. This is where you, when I do this, you talk back. That's how this works. Okay. If you're new here, we, we talk back. That's fine. He's talking to a lawyer. There we go. Right. And you might be uncomfortable like, oh no, a lawyer, not one of these guys. Right. But just pause real quick. Okay. It's not that kind of lawyer. In Jesus's day, uh, a lawyer was someone who was an expert in the law of God. So the first five books of the Bible. He's an expert in this. And did everybody catch the wrong question that he asked Jesus? It's easy to miss, but did you catch it? He asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be saved? And there you go. There's your first mistake right there. Because the Bible tells us that salvation is not about what you must do. It's all about what Christ has already done. Amen? There's your first wrong question. You're asking the wrong question, folks. It's not about what you must do. It is all about what Christ has done for us. The Bible's very clear on this. That you can do absolutely nothing to save yourself. And you, if you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm, I'm the exemption to this, right? I'm the exception. I can obviously do something because I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty moral person. I've been in church my whole life. I, 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 I'm a deacon. I serve. I, I, I participate in all these religious things. So, so surely that must contribute. And my answer is no, actually it doesn't. <laughs> None of that stuff can contribute to your salvation. It does not matter how good you think you are. It doesn't matter how moral you think you are. It doesn't matter how religious you are. You can do nothing to save yourself. Everybody in agreement? Amen? You can't. And the reason why is because the Bible says that we are dead in our sins. Here's an easy answer for you. What can dead people do? Nothing, right? Dead people can do nothing. So you can do nothing. You are dead in your sins. And unless Jesus comes and breathes new life into you and gives you new life in himself, you're going to continue to be dead in your sins. 
And I think we forget this sometimes. I think we know it in our heads, but we often forget that in our hearts. And here's what I mean by this. I mean that we'll often look at others who do not act like us, do not look like us, do not think like us, and we judge them for where they are at right now. We see people struggling with sins that we've never struggled with. We see people fighting battles that we have never faced. We see people dealing with issues that we've never dealt with. And we look at them and we go, look at them. They're such a horrible person. Did you know they're into this? Did you know they're doing this? I would never do such a thing. We love to look at people who are struggling and condemn them for their struggles and their battles because we've never been there. And even though we would never say it out loud, I know we wouldn't, we're too churchy for that, in our hearts, what we're actually saying is, I'm better than them. They're not as good as I am because I would never do that. And listen to me, in that moment, you have forgotten grace. You have forgotten that unless God had first moved towards you, let me tell you something, folks, you would have never moved toward him. Unless God had first pursued you and sought you out, you would have never sought him out. Unless God had first breathed new life into you, you would still be dead in your sins. So listen to me. Rather than judging people for their current struggles and their battles and their wrestling with sin, here's what you should do instead. You should start saying, but for the grace of God, that would be me. But for the grace of God, I would be the one addicted to drugs and alcohol. But for the grace of God, I would be the one in bondage to sexual sin. But for the grace of God, I would have gambled my life savings away a long time ago. But for the grace of God. It's God alone. It is His grace alone. It is not because you're better than people. It is not because you're more uh, disciplined than people. It is because God's grace has been at work in your life. And if he had not been at work in your life and given you grace, you would be just as bad in a different place than they are right now. You would be struggling with the same exact sins. You see, this concept of grace was foreign to the lawyer. It was completely foreign to him, which is going to lead to the attitude that he shows us in this passage this morning. So Jesus is is telling us this this morning to remind us that forgetting that salvation is by grace alone leads to pride and judgmentalism. Forgetting that salvation is by grace alone leads to pride and judgmentalism. I want to remind you of something this morning, folks. The grace that Jesus calls us to show others in our lives is based upon the grace we have received from God in Christ. The grace we're called to show is based on the grace that we've received. And so listen to me, if you will remember how much grace you have received from God, and if you will remember that the only reason you're a Christian in the first place is because of the grace of God, then you're going to begin to look at people completely differently. You'll start having a heart of compassion and mercy And you'll be able to sympathize with people because you'll say, if it had not been for God's grace, that too would be me. But, like modern lawyers, this lawyer likes to play with words. And so notice what he does next. He does what every sinner tries to do, which is justify their sins. Look at verse 29. It says, And he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? This is some pretty devious stuff. I think we we miss how devious it actually is because he's asked another wrong question. He's asking, who is my neighbor? But do you see what he's actually asking here? If you you begin to, to dig in deeper here, he's actually asking Jesus who he's required to love. He says, yeah, yeah, Jesus, I know all that stuff about loving God and and loving your neighbor as yourself. I can do all that as long as you tell me that the people you want me to love are the people that I actually want to love. As long as you tell me that the people I'm required to love are the ones that I'm comfortable loving. In fact, if you dig even deeper, he's asking a very sinister question here. He's actually asking Jesus... What is the least amount of people I'm required to love and still be good in the eyes of God? 
That's pretty bad, isn't it? What is the least amount of people I'm required to love and still be good in the eyes of of God. And this is a dangerous and sinful attitude. And here's what Jesus is going to show us in this passage. This passage, He's going to say that true Christians do not ask, who am I required to love, but rather, who needs love? True Christians do not ask, who am I required to love? They ask, who needs love? That's the heart of a Christ follower. Listen to me, if you're here this morning and you call yourself a Christian, if you are truly saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not called to question every person and every group of people trying to figure out who you're required to love and if you're required to love them. God has called you to go and show his love to all people, even them. Whoever your them is, even them. You're not called to question people. You're called to go and love people. And now let me say this. Even though we are called to go and love all people, that doesn't mean that you have to approve of their sin or affirm their sin. You understand that it's entirely possible for Christians to love people while not affirming or approving of their sins. I think that's especially important to remember here in the month of June. Because Christians oftentimes get a lot of flack about this, and and we're accused, and we're called hateful by a lot of people. And I know this because, as a Baptist pastor, I get a lot of hate. (laughs) I have a lot of people accuse me of stuff. They'll call me a bigot. They'll say, well, you're a Baptist pastor. You must hate everybody in the LGBT community. And I say to them, I've got a gay brother. And I love him. And if you were to ask my brother if I loved him any less than my other siblings, he would tell you no. If you were to ask him if I've ever made him feel unloved, he would say no. But if you were to ask him, do I approve of his lifestyle, he would also say no. Because I've been very open and honest with him that what he's doing, the Bible calls sin. And so I will not affirm his sin or approve of his sin, but I will love him because he's my brother. And that's what we're called to do. You can love people and not affirm their sin. And you go, well, well, it's hard to love people like that. It's hard to look at people who are actively sinning against God, who are rebelling against God, who are doing things that God disapproves of. Why should I love them like that? Because that's how God loved us, right? Don't imagine for even one moment that God loved you because he looked down on you and said, this guy's pretty good. I think I'm going to give him a chance. It didn't happen like that. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, God sent his son to die for our sins. The the Bible tells us that while we were enemies of God, while we were still following the prince of the power of the air, while we were still walking the course of this world, while we were in the depths of our sin, enslaved to it, God showed his love for us by sending his son to die for us. You didn't deserve it then. Let me tell you, you don't deserve it now. But that's how our God loves. And he has called us to imitate that love in the world by loving all people who are even still in the midst of their sins. So Jesus is saying, stop questioning who you're supposed to love and start loving people as Christ has loved you. And I want you to notice what Jesus is going to do next because it's one of my favorite Jesus things that he ever does. Okay, someone asks him a question, and he doesn't answer the question, right? I love it. Jesus never, almost never answers a question directly. Instead, he either normally asks another question, or he says a parable, which is what he does here. So if someone's asking him a question, he doesn't answer it. I've learned this from Jesus. I do it in my gospel group all the time, and they love it. They never, ever get frustrated by asking me questions that I just refuse to answer. So just, I learned it from Jesus. So, all right, look, verse 30 with me real quick. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. 
And whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Now, listen, Jesus' stories are absolutely scandalous, okay? I know it doesn't read that way today, but they are absolutely scandalous. And that's exactly how people would have perceived them when they heard this story of the Good Samaritan. You see, the first two people who come across this man are a priest and a Levite, right? So here's what you need to know about them, right? Every priest was a Levite, but every Levite was not a priest. That makes sense? It's kind of like today, every man or every pastor must be a man, but not every man must be a pastor, okay? So in order to be a priest, you had to be a Levite. And the priest was someone who worked vocationally in the ministry. So if you want a modern day example, you can think of him like a pastor today. And then you have the Levites, and if they did not become priests, the Levites became the temple workers. And so uh, they were the most religiously affiliated group of the day. Here's your modern example. Think about them as an active church member today, someone who's serving, participating, always here every time the doors are open. They're your Levites, right? So we read the story, and this man is beaten, left for dead, and here we have a pastor who finds him first. And we all expect the pastor to go and help him, right? I mean, that's the expectation. The pastor sees him, surely he'll have compassion on him. But the pastor goes by on the other side. But then there's a Levite, and the lawyers get excited again. He goes, okay, th- thank goodness there's a Levite here, so we'll be good. But the Levite, the active church member, passes him by as well. And then there's the Samaritan. And as soon as Jesus had uttered those words, I imagine this lawyer just shivered, just clenched up. I mean, he must have been absolutely furious because the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. To the Jews, like this lawyer, a Samaritan was the worst person on earth. You have to understand, a Samaritan was a person who had one Jewish parent and one Gentile parent. And the Jews looked at them as traitors and called them half-breeds. They hated them. They were the worst person on earth. It was literally the worst person Jesus could have made the hero of the story. And yet, that's exactly what Jesus did. Now, maybe you're not super uncomfortable yet. Maybe you're not really getting it yet. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a moment right now, and I want you to imagine... Who you would least like to be the hero of this story? Take a moment, think of a person, think of a type of person. Who would make you the absolute most angry and uncomfortable being the hero of this story? For for some of you in here this morning, the worst thing Jesus could have said was a Democrat walked by. And had compassion on this man. For others of you you in here this morning, the worst thing Jesus could have said was a Republican had walked by and had compassion on this man. For others, it might be someone in the LGBT community. It could be someone from your past. For many of you, it might be your in-laws. Don't look around if they're here, but it could be. Whoever you're thinking of now, I want you to think of that person who you would least like to be the hero of this story. That's your Samaritan. Now, I want you to pay attention to what happens next, right? The Samaritans are the bad guys. Jesus isn't supposed to make them the hero, and yet he does. And, and I want you to, to think about this. Some of you are still probably thinking about your own Samaritan. And, and you're probably thinking to yourself right now, well, Pastor, I don't have to worry about this because I know the person I'm thinking of would have never had compassion on this man. The type of person I'm thinking of would have never even helped him. That's the point. <laughs> Exactly that thought, that is the point Jesus is making here. He's saying, you're discounting certain people in your life or certain people that you know of and God's ability to love them and use them because of how you perceive them. And he's exposing those prejudices in our hearts just like the Jews had towards the Samaritans. You see, the point he's making here is the fact that we get to the Samaritan, right? And they were the hated enemies of God. And here's what we like to say. We, we like to say that no one is beyond the reach of God, right? And then what we like to say as Christians, no one is beyond the reach of God. But let's be honest with each other. Many of us in here this morning would be perfectly fine and content if God never reached 
certain people. Whoever those certain people are for you. It's one thing to sit in a church and say, oh yeah, no one's beyond the reach of God. It's another thing to actually desire God to reach all people. And we have this tendency to discount people based on how we perceive them. And and here's what Jesus is saying to us this morning. He's saying if God can love and use you, he can love and use your Samaritan too. As hard as that is for some of you to to understand and believe and, and wrestle with, God is saying if God can love and use you, he can love and use your Samaritan as well. Again, think about the fact that we say a lot of things in church because we've heard them repeated for years. So it's one thing in a church setting to say that no one is beyond the reach of God, but it is another thing entirely to actually desire that in your heart. You might understand that God can reach any person, but my question to you is, do you actually want him to? Do you actually want God to reach people who don't look like you? Do you actually want God to to reach people who don't act like you, who don't think like you, who don't vote like you? Do you actually want God to use you to reach people who make you uncomfortable? Because can I tell you something this morning? We're going to be surprised when we get to heaven and we see a lot of people there who would have made us uncomfortable here on earth. Can we just all agree with that? Yeah? What are some particulars? I'm glad you asked. I'll say a couple uncomfortable things to you this morning, and I just want you to wrestle with them. Uh, Let me tell you something, church. There are going to be Calvinists in heaven. There are going to be Arminians in heaven. There are going to be dispensationalists in heaven. There are going to be pre-mills, post-mills, ah-mills, and any other mills you can think of. There are going to be Republicans in heaven. And there are going to be Democrats in heaven. There are going to be people with tattoos in heaven. And I look forward to it. There are going to be ex-cons in heaven to the glory of God. There are going to be people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every language in heaven because that is God's vision for His covenant people. That is the goal that He is working towards. The question I want you to consider this morning is, are you working with Him or are you working against Him? Is God's vision for his covenant people your vision as well? Is that what you long for and hope to see? The lawyer has asked the wrong question twice now. But I want you to pay attention to these final verses because Jesus is going to ask the only question that matters. Look at verse 36. The Bible says, uh, Jesus is speaking here. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now, can can you just tell how uncomfortable and upset the lawyer is at this point? I mean, this did not go at all how he thought it was going to go. This did not play out like he thought it would. In fact, did you notice he is so upset by the fact that a Samaritan was the hero of the story. Did you notice he couldn't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan? Jesus says, who proved to be a neighbor? And he's like, I mean, I guess the one who showed him mercy. He he can't even say Samaritan. But, But pay attention to this. This is the most important part. Did you notice how Jesus flipped the question on its head? The the lawyer initially asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus is like, brother, you're asking the wrong question. The question is not, who is my neighbor? The question is, are you going to be a neighbor? That's what he's trying to get him to see here. He's saying, you're you're asking the wrong thing. You're wanting to know who you're supposed to love. And Jesus is saying, I'm calling you to go and be the neighbor. But let let me just point this out to you very quickly, church. 
Have you noticed how we're still asking the lawyer's question just in new ways today? The lawyer is asking, who is my neighbor? Who am I supposed to love? Who am I required to love? Who am I called to show compassion and mercy to? Have you noticed we're doing the exact same thing, asking that same question in new ways? There's so much debate today about when life begins and at what point a fetus is a human life. Is it a human? Is it alive? Am I supposed to love it? Am I supposed to have compassion on it? Are you seeing how that's just a new way of asking the same question, who is my neighbor? Uh, Maybe instead of asking if the fetus is a human and asking if the fetus is our neighbor, we should start being a neighbor to the unborn and also to mothers who find themselves in a desperate situation. Maybe Jesus doesn't want us to start asking a bunch of questions and questioning who deserves our love and rather start actually showing that love to all people, including the unborn. Many people today are, are wondering and asking if we have a responsibility to children in the foster care system. But maybe instead of asking that, we should step up and be a neighbor to children who have no home of their own. Maybe Jesus is saying, you're not supposed to question if you have a responsibility to them. You should go and be their neighbor. Maybe instead of asking whether or not immigrants who come to this country have a right to be here, and if they're our neighbor, we should step up and be a neighbor to them and help them as they seek to obtain legal citizenship and show them the same love and compassion and mercy that God has shown us in Christ. Maybe instead of asking who deserves mercy, we should start asking who needs mercy. Maybe instead of reserving our love for people who look like us, act like us, think like us, and vote like us, and instead of choosing only to love the people it's easy to love, we should step up and be a neighbor to all people and love those who are even hard to love. You see, this is Jesus' whole point of this parable. The whole thing comes down to this. He is telling us today to stop asking who is my neighbor and start asking who needs a neighbor. That's the paradigm shift. That's his whole point in flipping the question on its head. It's not about who is your neighbor. The question is, who needs a neighbor? Jesus has not called us as his people to question who our neighbor is. He has called us to go and be a neighbor to all people. And when you think about it like that, church, the answer to the question, is this person my neighbor, is always yes. Every time. No matter who you point to, no matter what kind of person they are, no matter what they've done to you, the question, is this person my neighbor, is always yes, because Jesus has called you to be the neighbor to that person. But if we're going to be a neighbor to all people, church, the way that Jesus has called us to, we have to remember the grace that he has shown us in Christ. No one entered into God's people deserving to be part of God's people or deserving His love. And if we're going to go and reach the lost, we have to lead with the grace and the love and the mercy that Christ has shown us. We have to stop discounting people based on how we judge them or based where they currently are in life. Because I don't know about you, but my God can save anyone. I could tell you testimony after testimony after testimony, even in this own church, of the wondrous and miraculous work that God has done in the lives of his people, even when you would have discounted them a long time ago. My God can save anyone. So we got to stop discounting people. We have to stop judging people. We have to stop uh, asking who deserves mercy and start asking who needs mercy. Most of all, church, we have to stop asking Who is my neighbor? We have to start asking, who needs a neighbor? When we do that, and we begin to be that neighbor to all people, God will use us to reach the lost and transform this world for his glory. Amen? Let's pray.